Kaike, Chapter 12 We returned to the palace one week later, when Dasharat was well enough to travel. There was a huge feast in his honour, and I sat at Dasharat's right hand. It was a joy to have a palace-cooked meal, and even more of a joy to lie down on my bed. I slept for half a day and woke feeling ready to start the work Dasharat had set for me. I approached Radni Sumitra first. I still had the memory of her well wishes fresh in my mind and she appeared less intimidating with her pleasantly rounded cheeks and ever-present smile. Sumitra responded with enthusiasm when invited to my chambers for an afternoon repast. As we ate the colourful milk sweet, Sumitra gossiped about a servant who had allegedly, allegedly been asked to leave Kaushalya service. I nodded along but my attention was in the binding plane, trying out the idea that had struck me in the evening. Dasharat made me his charioteer. I shaped our bond, doing my best to augment it, and I watched as the thin filament thickened into a robust embroidery thread. By that point, the string was shaking side to side quite dangerously, so I let go of the plane entirely. Sumitra was talking about some sewing project she was working on, so I decided to take a risk. In a drastic maneuver, I dug out my own haphazard work I had occupied myself with in the carriage to the battlegrounds. Sumitra laughed so hard that she cried and our bond strengthened tenfold to a firm cable that looked like thick wool more than I could have done with my magic. Towards the end of our time, the topic turned to a ceremony that was being planned in a few moons' time. I listened with half a year, for Rati's job at such events was to observe and look beautiful, until Sumitra said, Of course, because it is for the goddess, we will take part in the ritual. What? I asked, bemused. That had certainly not been the custom in Kekaya. The sages performed all rites with the occasional assist of the assistance of the men. It will not be much work, don't worry, Sumitra patted my hand. As though my concern was with the difficulty of the task, we will wash the statue and make the offerings. Lakshmi has blessed this kingdom with prosperity. I had not given much thought to the rules of the public rituals, but I cared little about trying to please the gods. But now Sumitra's word struck me differently. Here was yet another place where women were largely pushed aside, even the most devout. I barely heard the rest of what Sumitra said as we bade each other farewell, wrapped up in my own thoughts. The next day I enter, attended the Mantri Parishad for the first time. None seemed surprised to see me, Dasharat must have warned them, but I caught several men glaring at me when they thought I was not looking. In the binding plane, my connections to most were non-existent wisps, but despite his severity, Virendra seemed to respect me, as did the Minister of Finance. These two men, along with religious advisor Manav, an elderly man with whom I shared no bond at all, formed Dasharat's inner council. I focused on strengthening the few cords I had ever so slightly, but even by the end I had not yet built adequate rapport to con contribute to the council's deliberations. Even many of the men seemed bored, for the meeting was primarily occupied by a few ministers seeking custodianship of Sambarasura's old territories. I doubted I would ever build the necessary connections. To shout, you are idiots, are the arguing men without severe consequences. When the meeting was over, I returned directly to my chambers, wanting to remove my heavy jewellery. Only after stripping off my necklace and one jhumka did I realise I had company. Kaushalya stood at the other end of my room, half hidden in the shadow, shadows near the window. I dropped into an instinctual bow and then committed to it rather than repeat my first error. Radni, I did not notice you there. If she had wanted a better reception, she should not have entered my chambers and gone into my bedroom without permission. That much is apparent. Kaushalya walked slowly towards me. She looked lovely as always, dark coal framing her eyes and delicate gold gracious gracing her long neck i came here to talk to you about court but it has been some time since the public audiences adjourned i was listening to the meeting of the P mantri parishad i said gesturing behind me in a useless motion kaushalya knew where the court was located if kaushalya was surprised she hid it well a council meeting that is no place for a young woman i wanted to protest that i was not a young woman but petulance would hardly sway her Besides, to all others, the council was no place for any woman at all. I'm sorry you feel that way, I said at last, blinking into the binding plane and finding the black bond between us. It flickered in and out of my vision. 
which was concerning to say the least. It had long ago trained myself to only look at my magic from the corner of my eye. But part of me wanted to share, stare at Kaushalya's chest and watch the bond. I could hardly do that though. You've been here half a year, Kaushalya said, arriving in front of me. In that time, you've barely attended court, never spoken to me or Sumitra without prompting and shown little interest in the affairs of the king. Now you accompany him to battle, invite Sumitra to your rooms, attend council meetings and steal my best servant. I've done what? I squeaked. Most women considered poaching help to be one of the most despicable sins. Asha, all she has done for the past several days is speak about you. I remember with a start that Sumitra had talked about Kaushalya dismissing a servant just the day before. Oh, oh, please do not dismiss her. She was forced to attend me during the battle and perhaps something about that frightening experience struck in her mind. Dismiss her, Kaushalya asked her, lips disappearing entirely into a thin line. Why on earth would I do that? No, I simply assigned her to the kitchens for a week as punishment. It was annoying hearing all her stories of the camp and your deeds for the fifth time. Then who should visit me yesterday but Sumitra, also talking about the great Kaikeri? It seems I cannot escape you. Her manner conveyed the utmost annoyance, but at the end of her tirade, the bond between us had flared into firm existence. I ducked my head to hide my grin and examined the bond. It was delicate and gleaming like molten obsidian, and I imagined that it would feel exquisitely polished to the touch. I'm sorry, Radni. You do not sound sorry, Kaushalya said, and you do not need to call me Radni. We are equals. You will always be the first among us, I said. Kaushalya's nostrils flared as she inhaled and exhaled dramatically, and still her high cheekbones and large eyes kept her face the picture of beauty. What do you want? That was now twice in the span of a moon. Someone had asked me that when I had gone most of my life, never hearing it. As I had with Dashrath, I decided to answer her honestly. I would like to rest. It is a hot day and I have been wrapped in these stifling layers of silk for hours. You are the one who came to my room. I think the question is, what is it that you want? Kaushalya smirked. I wanted to speak to you. I wish to know your plan, to know why you have suddenly decided to act the part of a Radni. And I want to know what you hope to gain from Sumitra. She is a sweet woman, kind, unassuming. I won't have you using her for your own ends. You... I spluttered. You should speak to your husband. What does our Raja have to do with this? Kaushalya asked. He requests that I take up my duties with the court. No, as a matter of fact, he ordered me to take up my duties with the court. The words poured out of me in indignation. He brought it to my attention that I am a Radni and should act like one. You are correct. I have neglected my responsibilities for months. I have been remiss, uncertain in this new environment. And yet you too have neglected your duties. I did not ask for this marriage. Whatever resentment you have because of it should not fall on my shoulders. I am 18 years old. You are 9 and 20. You are Dashrath's first wife. You should have helped me. By the end of the speech, I was breathing heavily and had advanced several steps, forcing Kaushalya back. But improbably in the face of this onslaught, Kaushalya laughed. Why are you laughing? I demanded, unsure whether to be mortified or livid. Of course, this was Dasharat's idea, Kaushalya gaffed. Her lovely features had transformed with the laughter, smoothing her furrowed brow and opening up her expression so that it appeared nearly inviting. I should not be surprised. And you are quite young. It did not occur to me. I married Dasharat at your age, but he was younger then still. Still a Yuvraja, and I had no other wife to contend with. I could tell this was the closest I would get to an apology. Sumitra and I walk in the gardens almost every morning, Kaushalya continued. From now on, you may join us, but do not be late. And she swept past me and out of the room, leaving me gaping. My tirade had pushed me out of the plane and I forced myself back into it. Our bond had thickened in a matter of minutes, vibrant and polished as the jet black rocks on the banks of the Saraswati River. Had my anger somehow endeared me to her? I prodded it with my mind and it rippled lightly, cool water flowing over a stone. I thought over the conversation, hardly able to understand what had happened. Why had Kaushalya's suspicions been so easily allayed? Had her defense of Sumitra been genuine? I removed my other earring and my silk shawl and lay on top of my covers, the question circling about in my mind. A knock on the door startled me awake. Drowsily, I wondered if Kaushalya had come back to further interrogate me. Then I opened the door and I found Asha fidgeting in the 
hallway. Radni, Asha said brightly. Radni, Kaushalya sent me to you. She thought you might, you might appreciate having another lady in waiting. My mind immediately provided every possible negative interpretation. Asha might be a spy, beholden to report back to Kaushalya, or Kaushalya might have used this as an opportunity to be rid of Asha for some imagined fault. As if sensing my hesitance, Asha said she wanted to tell you this is a gift and that if you do not want my service, she would gladly have me back. She said that everything is shared between sisters. Between sisters, I could not push aside the warmth that had radiated through me at her words. She said that? I asked, unable to believe it. Yes, my lady. I smiled even as my body sagged in relief. My prospects in Ayodhya were rapidly brightening. Please come inside. The next morning, I stood at the entrance to the gardens at sunrise. I filled my lungs with the crisp morning air, delighting in the slight chill that reminded me of home. When would Sumitra and Kaushalya come down? I had not asked what time they usually meet. As the minutes went by, I began to wonder again whether this had been a ruse on Kaushalya's part. To humiliate me, to prove my powerlessness, the confidence I had felt upon finding Asha at the door yesterday quickly dissipated. I checked the binding plane several times as I waited. For once, glad that I had so few true bonds with people here, it made me search, it made my search for Kaushalya easy. Our thread remained the same, black and shining. I picked out my bonds with Dasharath, with Mantara and Asha, grounding me in Ayodhya from all directions. I did not often go into the binding plane without a particular person nearby to focus on. So I spent some time making a game of determining who the thinner tangle of threads might represent. After what felt like an hour of standing at the entrance, I gave up. Slowly, I turned around my rooms. Absorbed in my shame, I rounded the corner and ran right into the women I had been waiting for. Where are you going? Kaushalya asked from behind Sumitra as I scrambled to maintain my balance. I thought I had missed you. I hedged, hoping that would be an adequate answer. Both women were wearing light, plain kurtas and simple sandals. I felt mortifyingly overdressed in comparison. Mantra had suggested something less formal, but I had insisted I knew better, donning the elaborate skirt of a mint green ghagra. The stiff silk was heavy against my legs as I walked, and the embroidered hem dragged against the ground, if I was not careful. Kaushalya walked past me towards the garden's entrance and gestured towards the sundial in the centre of a courtyard. If you arrive by the time the dial is here, you will not be late, she said, indicating a time only a few minutes earlier. Sumitra offered me a smile as she walked towards the garden. I'm so pleased you could join us today. We wandered the looping paths, me on the left, Sumitra in the middle, Kaushalya on the right. I had come out here only once or twice, months ago. When I first arrived, at the time, many of the flowers had not yet bloomed and the walls of identical greenery seemed an, abs- an unsolvable maze that had deterred future visits. Now walking among silky blossoms of blue and purple and red, I could almost enjoy the surroundings and the company. Jasmine scented the air with a light sweetness and the hum of insects provided a pleasant accompaniment in the conversation. I had noticed very few words in Ayodhya's palace garden, but then birds always made me think of my father and my banished mother, so perhaps it was a blessing in disguise. Kaiki was there when it happened, Kaushalya said suddenly, pulling me from my reverie. She not only accompanied Dasharat to the camps, but drove his chariot into battle. What? Sumitra stopped walking and grasped my wrist. I made a half-hearted attempt to tug it before realizing that would be rude. After all, I had spoken quite non-committally non-committally about my time away at battle in the hopes of avoiding any mention of such unwomanly conduct. Is this true? Yes, I said, deeply uncomfortable with the attention. Don't blush, I instructed myself, as if that might help. I could feel the heat staining my cheeks. Dasharath himself told me, Kaushalya added. He said you were the bravest person on the battlefield that day, that you saved his life. I flushed further at this praise, hating my face for giving me away so easily. Dasharath had stayed true to his word. He had kept the truth hidden from the outside world, but had given me my due all the same. After he was wounded, I drove him to safety. That is all. That is all? Sumitra repeated. That is a great feat. Why did you not tell us? 
anybody would have done the same kaushalya snorted neither of us could drive a chariot down a wide road let alone a battlefield the gods guided me i lied all the same the gods do not assist unworthy they cannot make talent when there is none sumitra reached out and embraced me i stiffened for a moment not expecting such a thing but then i forced myself to relax and return the embrace it was sincere thank you i said with a smile we resumed our stroll i was trying to think what new subject i could introduce when kaushalya spoke again perhaps that is why you are so ill at ease um, among women talking about women's work she said you were raised by men to perform the tasks of men i considered correcting her telling her that the men i had been raised with had never thought of me as one of them but thought better of it perhaps i agreed perhaps we had completed a circle of the garden as we reached the sundial sumitra begged leave to go back to her chambers and prepare for the day i wanted to do the same but kaushalya's friendship would dramatically improve my life in ayodhya by the same token her enmity could make it intolerable so i lingered quiet as she crossed her arms and stared at the muddied hems of my skirts for what seemed like an eternity i wondered if i would ever feel put together in her presence we meet outside my chambers she said at last the hint of a smile playing on her lips in the mornings when we take our walk that's where we meet when we want to present a unified front to the court typically in the wake of scandals or threats we also meet there kaushalya lifted her gaze to my face as she spoke i was unsure how she wanted me to respond anger had worked well for me before in my chambers but it no longer seemed appropriate and we will all go to court together today there is to be a performance by dancers who have traveled all the way from videha they are renowned for their shiva tandava kaushalya started walking away from me then turned back around you will want to change out of that dress and in the future you need not dress so formally i smiled ruefully i hope the mud will come off if not kaushalya said drop her voice dropping to a dramatic whisper just have a new one made you're a radni So that's chapter 12. This uh is a chapter where Kaike is finally making friends in the court. Um for those of you already know the story, I think this is a turning point in how things go. And for those of you who don't know the story of Kaike, like I how I was when I first read this book. Um yeah, so let's let's keep reading and see how it goes.